When we look into deep space, we're met with stunning views of all kinds of galaxies, ellipticals, lenticulars, irregulars, and of course our beloved spirals, which is the topic of today's video. Even within our local group, we have absolute beauties such as the Andromeda Galaxy, the Triangulum Galaxy, and of course the Milky Way, which we can't take third-person images of because we're inside it, but we can make really good impressions based on the best data we have, such as this one which was made by Stefan payne Vardenar, JPL Caltech, and of course ESA, which has all these lovely extra annotations and labels on as well. Hold on, that doesn't actually look all that flat now, does it? I thought all spiral galaxies were meant to be totally flat like this diagram. Something doesn't seem to be right here, at least I thought they should be flat. Hi there and welcome to the channel and welcome back if you're a returner. Today we're going to be talking very briefly about the topic of my PhD that I will be doing for the next three and a half years, which is on galactic dynamics more specifically the warp and flare within the Milky Way, which we'll get into in a second. I cover a wide range of space-themed topics such as black holes, galaxies, spiral galaxies in particular, and of course smaller stuff like planets and the solar system. I also do a lot of crafty stuff such as space crochet, and occasionally I'll also do some sewing and quilting. Um, so if you're interested in all of that, I highly recommend you subscribe and join me on the journey. You would have seen that the title of this video isn't why isn't the Milky Way flat? Because I don't really have an answer, and if I did, I wouldn't actually be doing a PhD on the topic. In fact, I don't think anybody really knows concretely why the Milky Way has its warp and flare. Um, we do have quite a couple good ideas, a couple different uh, causes and factors that could be playing into the shape of the Milky Way. So today what I'm going to do is give you a really brief tour of the potential causes and some of the research that's been going on about the Milky Way. So to catch you up on the basics, the Milky Way has a warp, which is basically just an S-bend shape in its disk. We've known about this since the 1950s, and that was when we conducted a lot of neutral hydrogen surveys um, on the gas within the Milky Way, which is where we first discovered the warp. We've actually found quite a few galaxies with tiny warps as well, but with photometric data we've actually been able to figure out that the Milky Way's case is a lot more complex than we thought. Um, one reason being that uh, the warp's actually asymmetric and that it seems to affect the um, young stars more than the old ones and the dust and gas within the disk, so that kind of does add a little bit of spice to the problem. <laughs> My grand supervisor Walter Denon released a paper last year um, detailing and describing the warp through the view of Cepheid stars, which are variable stars where their luminosity varies with... it just varies over time, but the period of that sort of variance actually uh, strongly correlates with its luminosity and so they're really useful for figuring out distances within the galaxy. He found that the warp of course starts at around 10 to 11-ish kiloparsecs from the galactic centre and then it gets up to about a three degree incline after around 14 kiloparsecs. So to you that's quite a small warp but it actually is quite noticeable in terms of the data. As a side note, if you want to go look at papers, which I highly recommend you do, um, some papers actually use the term or they use uh, the Fourier azimuthal term, which is just uh, the letter M, and it can go from 0, 1, 2, or any integer upwards. Um, this is essentially just um, a way of sort of describing or detailing the sort of order of perturbation or disturbance. Um, so for m equals zero, um, that just is an undisturbed state, so there's no warp. For m equals one, which is what the Milky Way has, we believe, is an S-bend shape. Also, on one side you've got one bit going up, on one side you've got one bit going down, and then for m equals two it's essentially the same thing but it's quartered up, so you've... <laughs> I'll pop up a picture because it's easier to explain, but one quarter goes up, next quarter goes down, other quarter goes up, next quarter goes down. Um, I don't think we've actually seen this much outside in the universe, um, and for the purposes of the Milky Way it's only really useful to consider the m equals one case. Dr. Eloisa Poggio has some, or Poggio, I don't know which 
way to pronounce it has some really good diagrams in their papers um, that sort of explain the different terms really well. Um, so I'll pop one of those up as I'm talking, of course, um, but I also recommend reading up on all of their work because their work is just a big gold mine. Um, the other problem, of course, is the other half of the equation, that is the flare. So this is where the stars and gas essentially at the very edges of the discs and uh, tend to have quite a um, big vertical displacement from the disc. So it quite literally does as it says it flares out. Um, I haven't actually seen much discussion on it but that's probably because I'm very new to the topic and haven't read all of the papers that we have so far um, but of course I'll also be trying to figure out some stuff around that too. There have been numerous studies looking at the effects of one or potentially even two causes at a time and sort of modelling those disturbances and seeing if we can get a warp similar to what we see with observations. The general consensus seems to be that um, we know that the Milky Way has and still is interacting with satellite galaxies and of course neighbouring galaxies as well and it's probably uh, the most likely case that this is what's causing most of the warp that we see. The Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy and the Large Magellanic Cloud are the two galaxies that we most commonly focus on and that's because we have actually observed that they are indeed interacting with the Milky Way so of course those would be the top two galaxies that are contributing to the warp. Both have actually been studied independently and I believe also together and they have been shown to produce a S-bend or M equals 1 warp over the course of a couple billion years, which, yeah, sounds about right. One thing, though, is that a lot of these papers that I've read, they tend to, yeah, they produce that warp um, and, you know, of the right time scales, but they don't exactly match it perfectly, which is un completely understandable. Um, bear in mind, I am, of course, still new to the field, and so I haven't read up on every single top every single paper so maybe I'm still a little bit too naive on this topic I'm really sorry if I am um, but one thing I did notice is that we tend to stick more to the gravitational aspects of these interactions which I think makes sense of course um, but you know there are other things that maybe would be useful to sort of uh, mesh all to tie together um, with the simulations such as you know maybe like a misaligned angular momentum or misaligned gas in full in the case of the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy. Um, it probably already has been covered before but I just haven't seen it yet. Um, but I think they could be really useful to consider together with the gravitational influence of both of the galaxies as well. Um, we tend to use talk about these quite a lot when it comes to warps within accretion disks or protoplanetary disks. So I don't think there's any harm in maybe having a look at, you know, its effects on galactic scales. But maybe the reason I'm not seeing any of these papers is probably either because I haven't read too deeply or the fact that it doesn't really produce anything of worth. And so it doesn't, these results don't get published, which is really annoying, but maybe there's a reason for it. Oh my goodness, I'm really sorry about my nose, it's making me all high-pitched and nasally. <laughs> Another idea is that perhaps the dark matter halo around the galaxy could be uh, at least contributing to the warp and maybe even the flare as well. So last year, um, a published letter by another student gained quite a lot of popularity um, where they argued that a tilted dark matter halo with respect to the galactic plane, which is actually well within reality and could potentially be a possibility, um, plus I believe it was Large Magellanic Cloud Tidal Influences could explain everything with the warp and the flare as well. At least their conclusion said this. I couldn't really see it that much with their results, um, but one thing you have to remember is that if you want to publish with, you know, big journals such as Nature and Science, you do have to fluff up your conclusion a lot more to try and Get, uh, increase the possibilities of things getting accepted so I mean they did the right thing but I just I couldn't really see it very well with their results but you know it is the start of a really interesting uh, avenue to explore so maybe I might want to try and do something with that as well. One thing I really liked about the paper is that they focused on two uh, causes mixed in together uh, which is quite unique because a lot of papers I've seen focus on one topic or one cause at a time and this makes sense our computing power isn't you know infinitely good you know we can only pick and choose certain things that we want to model um, but I really did like that aspect and one thing I would really like to do going forward in my PhD is maybe try and 
tie a lot of things together and try and like uh, get a more I guess tailored approach to specifically the Milky Way sort of environment. And this isn't easy of course, if we want a good model we have to have things match the observations, and the observations are <laughs> quite quite uh, nasty as well, because one, we have to actually match the level of the warp of course, and make sure it's actually of the same sort of degree of warping. We also need to make sure that the warp is processing um, after about, I think, was it 10 or 11 kiloparsecs, and then it drops to about half that rate at around 14 kiloparsecs. The warp also has to be asymmetrical as well, and we also need to explain the same degree of flare as well. So that's a lot of things that come together to make quite a very particular scenario that we need to match fairly well, and it's very difficult. To conclude, We've got lots and lots of amazing ideas. Um, we've got loads and loads of research as well that has been put into understanding the shape of the Milky Way and some fantastic results as well. Um, hopefully for my own PhD, I'd like to, you know, contribute some more towards that and hope uh, that, you know, once I submit my thesis, I can at least help with getting a clearer view of what's going on in and around the Milky Way as well. There are a lot of other causes that I haven't really talked about, um, something to do with quadrupolar talks and like a lot of other sort of things that go on within the Milky Way that I'm not gonna lie, I really don't understand all that well right now, but hopefully <laughs> I will understand them a little bit better in the upcoming years. So if you're really interested in joining me throughout my journey as I try and understand the Milky Way a bit better, I really recommend you subscribe. I could do with the company, and by the time I submit my thesis I think we'll all be experts on galactic dynamics around here. So definitely join me with, the, uh, with my journey and I'll see you very soon.